Good morning, family. Good morning, Emmaus Church. How's everyone doing this morning? Come on. How's everyone doing this morning? Awesome, awesome. Good, good. Amen. You know, it's so amazing when, when God is setting us up to talk to us. It just seems like everything this morning that has happened and all the conversations that have been part of this morning kind of so neatly fit together into what we're going to be talking about this morning. And I really thank God for that, uh, that opportunity that we just had there to be uh, hear about that ministry and really to be Christ and, uh, to that ministry and through that ministry. We thank God for that. But before I get going this morning, I want to I wanna just take a brief moment. I don't want to uh, make any assumptions. Um, and so let me Again, my, uh, introduce myself. My name is Gia. Uh, I previously was here at Emmaus and did an internship here for about a year. And um, from that, we were sent to South Florida to start a new multi-ethnic church down in Pompano Beach, which is about 10, 15 minutes north of Fort Lauderdale and uh, about 30 minutes from Miami. Um, so that's where I currently am from here, and uh, I just wanted to put that out there in the beginning, so as I said, don't want to uh, uh, as make any assumptions that anybody here or everybody knows, knows me, uh, although this is my church home, this is our home, as my family, my wife and my kids are here, and you probably see them. They also, uh, we're commuting back and forth right now for the time being until the end of school when we, you know, settle down on a house down there. And then the rest of the family will be coming down. You'll probably see less and less of us. Hopefully that's not a good thing, you know. (laughs) Uh, But I just want to thank all of you for all of your help. I want to thank you for all of your support. There are many of you that have directly partnered with us and have been giving every month, and that's been a huge encouragement. And then even the rest of us who give to this church, because through your giving, Emmaus also supports us. And so... To just everyone, I just want to say thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Um, Just a little update. The first few months down there uh, were very difficult. I'd be lying to you and tell you if it wasn't, you know. But I thank God in the past uh, month or so, we've been kind of picking up momentum and and getting some traction down there. People have started coming little by little. And uh, we have a lot of things set up on the horizon that uh, things are starting to look much more encouraging, you know. So as you can see by the smile on my face, uh, it's, I've gone through, we've gone through some pretty tough times. I'm not saying that that's all there is. I know there are tougher times ahead, but there is momentum now. And I thank God for taking us through that time. And I want to thank all of you for all your prayers. For those of you that pray for us, I want to ask you to continue praying for us. Uh, it is definitely needed. Um, we need the prayers to, keep, you know, to take us through those times when there is discouragement, because there is sometimes there is that discouragement. Uh, we want to ask you to pray that God will grant us grace to, to live and walk by faith and not by how things look around us, because you can, you can easily get into that where you're looking, the way, looking at how things look around you, and when it doesn't look the way you want them to look, uh, it can be discouraging. But by God's grace, through your prayers, the Lord will give us the grace to go through those times. So I want to thank you for that. I want to ask you to continue to pray for myself and my family as we are apart. That's one of the biggest things that I can say. I personally underestimated the impact of being away from my family. And as this time has extended a little longer than what we expected, um, it's tough. You know, uh, be this is the longest time my wife and I have been apart from each other, being apart from my kids. My family as a whole is is very tough, you know, um, but, you know, it's God's work, and there's a reason that he decided that we would do things this way and that we'll go this way, and so I thank him for everything. We give all the praise and all the credit, and and all the glory goes to God for what he is doing uh, through Emmaus, through us down there in South Florida. So again, I want to thank you, and above all, I want to thank the Lord. You know, apparently... Vic decided to take time off today to go and get stuck in a snowstorm, you know. (laughs) 
I'm glad to be here in Florida. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I had enough snow and stuff like that in Chicago, dealt with it, so I'm not missing it at all. But it's an honor to be here and speak to us this morning. When I was asked to speak this morning, and Vic told me that he had started a series on the book of John, and he asked me to speak, and specifically about this particular chapter that he asked me to talk on, I was excited. I was so excited because this is, I mean, I love God's word. But this is one part of the Bible that kind of just, when I read it, when I study, when I get into it, just, you know, something just comes out. So excuse me if I'm a little more animated today than I normally would be. I'm excited when I'm talking about this topic that we're going to be covering today, you know. And so without much wasting of time, I'm going to get into it today, into our Uh, study in the book of John, the story of heaven, the story of heaven on earth. What an awesome, awesome topic. Vic did a lot of groundwork. He covered a lot of groundwork in his uh, introduction uh, last Sunday, and so I'm glad about that. I don't have to, you know, cover a lot of stuff. Uh, He made a lot of connections that needed to be made, and how John is, you know, it reads kind of like Genesis and has that same kind of feel. So, um, Thank God for that. We don't have to go over that, so I can really just dive right in. But let me start with this this story. There's a story that was written in the um, Newsweek magazine of a lady named Nancy, uh, Nancy Rain, where she recalls another story that she had been told 25 years prior to that time by a friend of hers named George. And George was telling a story about a time in which he worked on a construction site. And in those days, what they would do, they set out like smudge pots uh, to mark a construction site, and they would leave flames in them. And he had a little daughter, George. That is, George had a daughter by the name of Sarah. She was about, I think, four years old or so. And so Sarah got so close to one of those pots, her pants caught on fire. And, um, I mean, the flame lit up and burned like it was burning straw. As a result of that, she developed marks and whelps, burn marks on her legs, up and down her legs, was so much and so extensive, they looked like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle just up and down her legs. And one day when she was in third grade, they asked her a question. And they asked her, if you have one wish, Sarah, what would it be? And she said, I wish everybody had legs like mine. And you know, that's the thing, my brothers and sisters, is that when we experience pain, when we are going through trial, we want others to be able to identify with us. We want others to be able to feel our pain. We don't want to be alone. We want to know that somebody understands what we're going through. And today we're going to talk about how God, the God of heaven and earth, what he did to identify with us, what he did to show that he understands what we go through. The topic of God's word to us this morning is the continuation of the incarnation. And of course, we're going to be coming from the book of John, starting out in the first chapter. We're going to be covering verse 14. Let me put my uh, second pair of eyes on here that I need to read. It's amazing. When I was much younger, I didn't need this stuff, you know. It's like time is tapping on my shoulder and letting me know that things are, things are not the same. <laughs> Things are not what they used to be, but we thank God anyway, nonetheless. So we're coming from verse, starting from verse 14 of John chapter 1 to verse 18. Very short four verses that we're going to be covering, but these four verses 
has so much substance, so much meat in these four verses. Do we have that image to put up here? Thank you. As we read through these few verses today, I want us to think about John in this way. Think about him as a witness, a credible witness sitting on a witness stand in a courtroom and giving an account where what he's doing is like somebody putting together the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. He is speaking here today as a witness, credible, very credible witness, an eyewitness, recalling experiences that he has had. And he puts together, he is putting together pieces, joining together pieces, ending in giving us a definitive name. And so I know last week when Vic started, he kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit because I want to ask you, I was going to say I want to ask you to indulge me, but it's not really me. I want to ask you to indulge the text of Scripture because, you see, as we start even from verse 1, there's never any proper name given when we look at the text starting from John chapter 1 verse 1 until much later on in about, I think it's verse 17, where we actually get a name. He is talking about somebody that is referring to as the Word. So, many of us here are used to going to church. We've gone to church. Most of us, many of us are Christians. We've heard this story before. We've read it before. We know the, 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 the script, these passages very well. But I'm just going to ask you, let's indulge the text and let's pretend like we don't know who he's talking about. Okay, let's just go along with the text as, he's, as John is going along. Let's go along with John and act like we don't know the name of the person that he's talking about. The continuation of the incarnation. Now I'm going to start reading from verse 14 of John chapter 1. By the way, I'm reading the New King James Version. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him, that is John the Baptist. There are two Johns here. Let me clarify that. The person who is writing this passage, this book, is John the Apostle. The one that is spoken about here in verse 15 and earlier in verse 6 is the one referred to as John the Baptist. So verse 15, John bore witness, John the Baptist bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now let's park it there for a minute. John says that the word became flesh. The word, this person called the word, you know, how many of us here have watched the X-Men movies? I like sci-fi, so. X-Men or Star Wars, right? After, it's like after they make so many of the movies, part one, part two, part three, they go back usually sometimes and they give you the story before the story, right? And it's not called a sequel, it's called a what? A prequel. And so really, to see the Word becoming flesh, what happened before the Word became flesh? What was the Word before the Word became flesh? It's kind of necessary for us to get like a prequel. 
And so let me do that real quick as we go on here. And let's start by going back to John chapter 1, verse 1. Verse 1 through 3, I'm going to read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this person who became flesh, John is saying here that it was God. So we could effectively say God became flesh. God became a human being. But there's a couple of things here that I want to point out. In the beginning, now we know in the beginning when creation was occurring, was happening, he said, he is saying here that this person called the Word was there. And that he was with, and the Word was with God, God the Father, that is. So John is talking about two distinct persons. There is a person called the Word, and there is a person who is God the Father. John is saying here also, although he's talking about in the beginning in creation, there's another inference here that as long as God the Father has been around, this person called the Word has also been around. People who study theology, who study the Bible, there's a fancy word that they use for that, or a fancy term that they use for that. Not very fancy, but there's a term that they use in describing that. They will say that the word is co-eternal with the Father. Meaning that as long as God the Father has been around, this person called the word has also been around. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Now that is mind-blowing. If you know what he's saying. John is saying here, not only is this person called the Word been around as long as God the Father has been around, but John is saying it's, 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 he's kind of creating like a math equation here for us. You know in, in math when you say 1 plus 1 equals 2? You're saying the thing on the left side is the same as the stuff on the right side, right? John is telling us here that this person called the Word is equal, is the same as God the Father. That is mind-blowing. Two distinct persons, but yet they are one. Let me try to explain it a different way. If we think about DNA, you know, and, and some of the advances in, in biology and, and, and our understanding of the human body and things and life pretty much comes through understanding of DNA. One thing we understand is that no two people, two peas in a pod, do not have the same DNA. Twins from the same womb, born even seconds apart, do not have the same exact DNA. And so a lot of time when they're solving crimes, if your DNA is on the scene... Buddy, I'm sorry you're in trouble. Right? Because that is a definitive identifier. This is in the natural. John is saying here that there are two distinct persons, the Word and God the Father, who are the same. He is saying that they have the same DNA. I could drop the mic on that and leave the stage. That, that's, I mean, that, that, that is enough, that's enough to chew on. That's enough to blow your mind. That this person called the Word, who became flesh, God became flesh, who is God, is co-eternal, co-essential of the same essence as God the Father. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Word not only is the author of creation, he is also the source 
of life. We're talking about the prequel here to him, the word, to God becoming a human being. What came before? He became a man. Isaiah chapter 6, we see in Isaiah chapter 6, can we put that up there? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. 750 years before he became flesh, the Word became flesh, God became flesh. 750 years, God allowed Isaiah to have this vision. And he said that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one cried one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. This is describing a scene of majesty and splendor. The Word made flesh before he became flesh is describing him in majesty and splendor, describing the supernatural being worshiping him. Creation worshiped him. Psalm 24 verse 1 tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. Everything belongs to to the Word made flesh. He is the source of life. He is the author of creation. He is the same one that became flesh. Daniel describes him as the ancient of days. He has no beginning. He has no end. Now, there's a tendency, there may be a tendency when we say that he became flesh, there's a tendency for us to possibly think that maybe he, he stopped being one thing so that he could become another, that he stopped being God and became another to take on flesh. That's not what is meant here, really. What it's trying to say to us, what it's conveying to us is that divinity, God himself, divinity took on and added on humanity. To himself. That divinity clothed itself in humanity so that one day humanity will be clothed in divinity. That, 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 that immortality dressed itself, himself in mortality so that one day mortality, that is you and I, will be dressed in immortality. He never stopped being God. This is the the most amazing that the God of heaven and earth, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, would become a baby, an infant, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. God became a human being. He incarnated He took on flesh. He left his comfort zone. So we see here everything that he was before he took on flesh. He left his comfort zone. The universe worshipped him. You see, he seated on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Splendor and majesty were in his presence. He left all of that to come down. And he did not just take on flesh. He could have come down and just set up a holy temple on a mountain somewhere and stayed there and sent out angels to do his bidding. Sent out holy men to do his bidding. And stayed up there in a mountain in some holy temple. But John doesn't stop there. There's an end. There's an end. It said, the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. He lived among us. So not only did he incarnate, he went on mission when he got here. He became missional. 
Any good missionary that will tell you one of the first things they want to do when they get into a culture is to become, start to identify with the culture, to learn the, the norms, to learn the culture, to learn the day-to-day -day life of people, to identify with the people. God came, became a man. Not only did he stop there, but then he also went on mission to identify with me, to identify with you. Hebrews tells us that we do not have a high priest who cannot identify with us, but that in every way he was tempted as we are yet without sin. He knows my day-to-day -day struggle. You see, he knows my day-to-day -day issues, your pain, your shame, your challenges. He is able to identify. But look at this. Something amazing happened. Because he took on flesh, because he went on mission, because he was incarnational and missional, something amazing happened because of that. As we continue to read, it says, he became flesh and he dwelt among us, and then this happens, and we beheld his glory. God became human. God lived among us. John is talking here not as somebody who heard something. Remember, this is a credible witness in the court of law. If we look at John chapter 1 verse, verse 1 to, John, excuse me, 1 John, 1 John 1 verse 1 to 4. It says here, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. John is saying we touched him. God became a man, a human being, and he lived with us. We touched him. We ate with him every day. He taught us. We saw him with our own eyes. I'm not telling you something that I heard from somewhere else. He said, I saw him myself. We were there when he was transfigured, and we heard the voice from the cloud. We were there when he fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. We were there when with just a word from his mouth, he calmed the wind and the sea. We were there when he was executed brutally. I was at the foot of the cross when they stabbed him and pierced him to make sure he was dead. We saw him buried. And we were there when he came through the walls. The door was locked. He came through the walls and just stood among us. And he showed us the nail prints in his hand, the, the spear mark in his side, that he had resurrected three days later from the dead. This was God. This is the person that I'm talking about here. John is saying, this was God in the flesh. We were there when he, when, when he ascended. And we saw the clouds take him away out of our sight. Because he lived among us, we experience his glory. We encountered his glory. And subsequently, when he said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. This is the rock that he was talking about. This unmovable truth, this unshakable truth, this unassailable truth about who Jesus is, about who the Word made flesh is, as presented to us through the testimony of the apostles. That truth is the, is, is the rock, the foundation upon which he is building his church. We beheld his glory. 
You know, he demonstrated to us what we are supposed to be as a church. That we are supposed to be incarnational. That we are supposed to be missional. You can't have one without the other. He demonstrated that. If indeed, as Galatians 2.20 says, that it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me, if that is true, if it is true that Philippians 2.13 says that, 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 that it is he that is at work in me, giving me the will and the power to do those things that please him, if indeed it is true that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, then it is true that you and I, if the Spirit of God dwells within us, that the incarnation didn't stop. That the incarnation, that we are a continuation of the incarnation. And that we are to be incarnational and missional. And it is through us being that to the world out there that people will be able to say, I experienced the glory of God. I experienced the love of God through you because you are a continuation of his ministry here on earth. You are a continuation of what he came to do here on earth. We are a continuation of the incarnation. You cannot hold to the comforts of this world. He released the good that he had. He released what he had. So that he could come and identify with us. Through us, through us, the world must come to experience the grace of God. We must make Jesus tangible. We must make Jesus Christ tangible to the world out there. And so my question to us is, you know, and one of the things I can say this, one of the things I love about this church is that this is a church that is living this stuff out because it is evident in our mission moments every day, every Sunday that we come here and we have mission moments, that this church is being incarnational but also missional that we are allowing people out there, outside of these walls, to come into an experience of the glory of God. But I want to ask us, how in my neighborhood, on my job, how am I being incarnational? How are you being missional? How is people around you, your neighbors, your co-workers, your family, how are they coming into an experience of God's glory, God's love, God's presence through you because he is in you? I didn't go to, you know, it, something dawned on me when we were preparing to go down there, when I was preparing to go down there, and I'm like, and I'm not saying to boast or anything, I didn't even realize this. It's just in a moment of reflection. It came to me, and I think I shared this with Vic. But here, I mean, we, I've, I, I had a good job here. We have a nice house, decent house. We're stable. Our kids are going to decent schools. We have one in college. Things are okay. There's no, there was no need for us to leave here and go somewhere completely where it's completely new. We got to start all over. But he is at work in us to do those things which please him. He's given us the will and the, and the power to do those things that please him. How are we being incarnational? How are we being missional? Let's continue on. John bore witness and cried out, saying, This is he of whom 
of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. How, John, can this person be before you? In the natural, this is your cousin you're talking about. He was born six months after you. You were born before him. How can he be before you unless you're talking about your bearing witness with John the Apostle that he is indeed eternal? That you're not talking about natural things, but you're saying something about the Word made flesh. Verse 16, and, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace, look at that, but, the word but is there, for the law was given through Moses, but, he's trying to tell us something about what comes before the but and what's coming after it. You know, there's a joke in here somewhere, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In those days, Israel considered itself, the Pharisees considered themselves disciples of Moses. Their whole life was around all that Moses had given them. All that they had received from Moses through the law is what they lived on. That's, that was their bread and butter. John is saying here, he's contrasting, he's comparing the two ministries. The ministry of the law versus the ministry of grace. It's so interesting. In 2 Corinthians two, uh, 3, verse 6, it tells us, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, another way of referring to the law, kills, but the Spirit gives life. In Galatians 2, 23, verse 21 to 22, says that, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could give, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Verse 22, But the Scripture has confined all under sin that the promise that is the promise of God made to Abraham. That promise that through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. That the promise of God to, Moses, to, to, to Abraham, the promise by faith in Jesus Christ, by faith in the Word made flesh, might be given to those who believe. The ministry of grace Grace is God's greatest gift to you and I. It is through grace that we receive life. It is through grace that we receive the promise of God by faith through the Word made flesh. The letter kills. It's dead. But the Spirit gives life. The ministry of the Word made flesh gives life. The ministry of the Word made flesh. Grace comes only through, he said it here, and that crossword puzzle, I mean the, the jigsaw puzzle that he was putting together that he has meticulously been piecing together now comes together and he gives us a definite name. And he said that grace and thr truth came through Jesus Christ. The greater ministry, the ministry that is far exceeding the ministry of the law. Because life could not come through it. The grace of God did not come through it. But life came only through Jesus Christ, who is the giver of grace. Through whom we experience the grace 
of God. We experience, we receive life eternal. This is a greater ministry, and it comes only. Now, it's so amazing. You might think, why, 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 why give a name? Isn't it enough? Because I guarantee you, with the way the world works, even though a name has been given, it doesn't stop people from replacing that name with someone else. Had John not given a name here, somebody would have been saying he's talking about Muhammad. He's talking about Confucius. He's talking about Buddha. But he is not because grace comes only through Jesus Christ, not through Muhammad, not through Buddha, not through Confucius, through no one else. Grace of God has come only through the Word made flesh, through God becoming flesh, who is none other than Jesus the Christ. He is the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. He is the author of creation, the same one who is the author of creation, who is the source of life, who is the giver of grace, who is the ancient of days, who is the one who was high and seated and, and lifted up in Isaiah's vision, is the same person we know as Jesus Christ. Hebrews tells us that he is the express image of the invisible God. Elsewhere it says, I believe it is in Colossians that it says, it says that, that, that in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. No one else, there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved, by which grace is given. The only name is the name Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, God in the flesh. Verse 18, the last verse, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He, He alone has declared Him. Now that's amazing. We may look at that and see a contradiction in there. Because when we look in Exodus, Exodus 33, verse 11, it says, no one has seen God, excuse me, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Is that not what it says? But here John is saying nobody has seen God. What's up with that? Is that a contradiction? Is the Bible contradicting itself? Genesis 32, 30, uh, 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 we, we also read, So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for he, for he said, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. What's going on here? Is John lying? He says, No one has ever seen God. Only Jesus Christ. who is in the bosom of the Father, he is the one who has revealed, who has declared to us God. You see, in the Old Testament, there were pre-incarnate manifestations. These people had an experience. They had encounters of God's glory. They saw anthropomorphism or, 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 or manifestations of God's glory. They had an experience where they encountered certain part of God. But the essence, John tells us in few chapters or later in, verse, in chapter 4, he tells us that God is spirit. No human being can see spirit. So the only person that has laid eyeballs, that has laid, that has seen and declared the Father God to us, is the one who is in the presence of the Father and is able to reveal to us fully. They saw pieces, bits. God wants, so Moses said he wanted to see God. God said, you can't see me and live. But he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass by. And as I pass by, 
I'm going to let you see the residue of my glory. Not even my glory, but the residue. And just that alone, when Moses came down, people couldn't look in his face because his face was shining so brightly. These people had an experience, but they did not experience the fullness, the one in whom the fullness of God dwells bodily, the one who is the express image of, the, of, 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 of God himself. They never had that experience. That was only revealed to them, to John and, his apostles, and the apostles. They said they saw him, they touched him, they experienced him, and they passed that on to us. We have more than, than Moses, than Jacob, than Abraham, than all these people had. We have more than they experience. And so... The only way that you can know if you're here today and you don't know God. The only way to know him, the only way to have a relationship with him is through the word made flesh, through Jesus Christ. Because there is no one else. There is no other name given. It is only Jesus Christ through whom we receive full revelation of who God is. He told Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He told the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. They picked up stones to stone him because they knew what he was talking about. They knew he was claiming to be God in the flesh. Only through Jesus Christ can you experience, can you have an encounter with the true and the living God. Levi, you can come back up. You can start coming back up, bro. If you want to know God for yourself and have a relationship with him, the only way you can do that is through Jesus Christ. I'm not going to call anybody up. I'm not going to, you know, but you need to make a decision if you have not made that decision yet. And all you have to do is confess your sins, acknowledge that he died for your sins. And we're talking about being missional. You know, one of the things that I experienced in South Florida is that people have such a bad taste in their mouth for church because they've been hurt, because they've seen so many things. And if anybody is here like that, I want to I wanna seriously from the bottom of my heart apologize to you for any negative experience. That is not incarnational. It's not missional. It's not what you're supposed to experience. That is not God intended for you. But don't let that stand in the way. Don't let the enemy use that from allowing you and giving you the opportunity that he makes available you to know him and to love him and to allow him to work in your life. Amen? Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you.